Welcome to Philosophy with Xing, where we uncover the beauty behind philosophy. In today's episode, we'll be looking at a question critically assess the claim that knowledge is impossible because bias is inevitable. All right, that sounds like a great mouthful. So let's slowly dissect this um, large claim. So first, the claim is that knowledge is impossible. Why? Because bias is inevitable. So is this claim drawing a causal link between bias and knowledge? Yes. So if this is A and this is B, the question is essentially saying A cannot happen because of B. So because of B does not lead to A. All right. So that is the first thing that we need to understand. The second thing that we need to understand beyond the causal relation is what are those words? What are those keywords in the question? The first keyword is knowledge. Second keyword is impossible. Third one is bias and the fourth is inevitable. Let's go from left to right. All right, so what is knowledge? If we adopt the Plato's tripartite definition, justified true belief, in our essay or in our response to this question, then knowledge is justified true belief. And I think it makes things simpler to just stick to one definition of knowledge. You don't want to be jumping from here to there. And with a, a, a well-defined idea of knowledge, we are able to systematically attack whether bias compromises justification, truth, or belief. So we don't need to, well, come up with a really complicated definition of knowledge and then it makes it hard to prove things that you want to prove in your essay or, or makes it like proof, proof in your response. Okay, so the second keyword is impossible. What does impossible mean? In relation to knowledge, it simply suggests that we cannot have knowledge. Right? We cannot have knowledge because there is bias. And let's look at the idea of bias now. So the third keyword, what is bias? Well, we can we can consider three things actually um, um, when we are thinking about what bias is. The first thing that comes to mind in a more current affairs angle, it will be cultural and religion kind of bias. So cultural and religious biases. Okay, so cultural could be like um, certain cultures that you come from, maybe your upbringing, your background, and all of these cultural and religious biases come from personal and social context of the inquirer. So who is this inquirer? This inquirer is basically the person who is constructing this knowledge. And when you're talking about personal and social context, you need to be you need to be specific about what kind of personal context, what kind of social context. So personal context is it like your upbringing, and if so, what is it about the upbringing? You must be really specific when you're trying to prove your point that there's bias. Avoid sweeping statements, avoid over generalizations because they don't prove a point. Simply saying that everybody grew up in a different family does not prove your point that there's a bias. You need to show what exactly caused this bias and how does this bias manifest in, in so far as this knowledge becomes impossible. So you must be specific. Okay, and given this personal and social context of the inquiry, we then ask ourselves, okay, how does this affect our objectivity? How does it affect objectivity? So how does this this how does this whole thing affect objectivity? You need to think about does it affect the justification and truth of knowledge, which is J and T of K, justification and truth of knowledge, or and also in terms of objectivity, how about objectivity in different areas of knowledge? There might be some areas of knowledge that are not really compromised by, by your personal and social context because the nature of the area of knowledge in itself prizes your own personal and social context in creating this knowledge. 
one example I can think of the back of my head, of the back of my hand would be art and how your personal and your social upbringing, your, your social context, where you came from, understanding and your own interpretation of the artwork is valuable in constructing unique aesthetic knowledge of the art piece, which nobody else can construct. So that's the value of that. That's the value of the that's the value of aesthetic knowledge. That's the value of knowledge of art. That by that not having bias takes away. So objectivity could be different in different areas of knowledge, and in some areas of knowledge, actually this bias might be beneficial. So we must consider that as well. And as for different areas of knowledge, let me just quickly list it down. Eastern and Western knowledge, we all know how there are different, very distinct and different spheres of thought in the East and the West. And there's gender, there's social sciences. And in social sciences, we can think about anthropology. And we can cite this um, anthropologist, Margaret Mead, where we can see that her personal biases and her personal upbringing in the in the Western world really heavily influenced her research of the Samoan female teenagers when she was actually living there and conducting an anthropological study over there. So that is where this is an example of how biases kick in 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 studying something and constructing social scientific knowledge. Another era of knowledge, language. How is language shaped by social and personal contexts? For example, in Chinese, Qing is blue. Qing also means green. And that was because in the past, people saw blue and green as the same color. And language also affects the way you construct knowledge. For example, there are some, I, if I remember correctly, there are some ancient civilizations that had the same word for a really wide spectrum of colors. So when they were asked to identify shades of color in a scientific experiment, they actually identified many different types of colors as the same color because language shaped thought. So you can go and read up more about it if you're interested. Next, historical biases and the bias of the historian. Oh, that is one that is quite common where the historians do have biases perhaps due to the uh, political context that the historian was living in when constructing this historical knowledge and making his or her historical inferences. And these biases will shape the type of historical knowledge constructed. So I will write here, political leanings will also affect the way that you want to portray and narrativize history. For example, whether or not you're using a Marxist lens, you're using some other political lens, it will really affect your language and your depiction, your use of language in depicting a historical event, your narrativization of it and your depic depiction of it. In terms of gender, all right, we forgot this feminist standpoint theory, which will also shape our way that we construct knowledge as well. So after listing out all these big ideas, we can ask ourselves, to what extent do the biases affect objectivity of the knowledge? So to what extent do the biases affect objectivity of the knowledge? It might, ob it might um, some of the biases might affect objectivity of some areas of knowledge more so than others because of the nature of those areas of knowledge. Okay, let's move on to the next point. So this is our first point. This idea of biases, we can think of cultural, religious biases, and now, okay, we have already identified all the biases. So we have to ask ourselves, what are the methods to mitigate these individual biases? Peer review. In science, you have uh, different scientists reading one another's research papers, spotting possible loopholes in their argumentation or perhaps uh, possible confirmation biases. All of this can be examined through peer review, but obviously you can definitely know that there are limitations to peer review. Maybe all of them are actually biased altogether. There's an epistemic bubble or there's a whole like web of false beliefs, whatever. So we still can assume that 
peer review is quite beneficial. Although, yes, there definitely are going to be limitations to peer review, but there's no perfect solution. The next method to mitigate bias is veto power of the sources. If you watch my previous video, I mentioned cost selects veto power of the sources that's used in history, where if there are many uh, contradictory historical narratives, the historical sources would be put, to the put on the table and historians would debate about which historical narrative best aligns to the historical source. This allows history and historical knowledge to be grounded in actual historical facts and historical sources rather than just being purely tales of fiction that are spun up by historians. So that, that gives some objectivity to history. Okay, so we have to think of methods to mitigate individual biases. And now, let's move on to the third point, which is how much of a role object, uh, subjectivity plays in the nature of knowledge itself. So remember what I said, I think about two minutes ago, I did say that up here, to what extent do the biases affect objectivity of the knowledge? For some, it might not even affect per se. Biases may actually enhance the, the quality and the nature of the knowledge constructed because subjectivity does play a role in the nature of knowledge itself. So this is a really tricky um, uh, line of reasoning and you do have to navigate yourself really carefully over at point three because you might run the risk of contradicting yourself in point one, which is about cultural and religious biases and how they, are, they affect the objectivity of the knowledge. And then now you're saying that actually subjectivity is plays a, a substantial role in the nature of that area of knowledge itself. So you really have to be careful in navigating points one and point three. That being said, in addressing point three, you can ask yourself, is mitigation necessary depending on the nature of knowledge. In other words, maybe in some areas of knowledge, you actually don't really need to mitigate subjectivity because it is it, the subjectivity is indispensable to the area of knowledge. So that's really quite an interesting nuance. And of course, if you want an extra depth to your answer, you can also bring in some areas of knowledge that are actually not really very susceptible to biases. One that I can think of right now is mathematics. I'm not really sure how you can be biased in mathematics because one plus one equals to two, you can't really debate that. Well, there are different systems of math like Euclidean geometry, Riemannian geometry, and then now Einstein's uh, relativity that is based on Riemannian geometry. But there isn't really some sort of uh, hidden agenda that mathematicians could have in, in twisting mathematical knowledge. So yeah, this is how I could approach dissecting this question. And that's all for today's episode, actually. Hope that you enjoyed it and see you at our next episode. Bye bye.